Today, I want to talk about something that you may have never thought of before. The title of my sermon is, When Mountains Crumble. Now look at that picture of a mountain. I don't remember which mountain that is. But how gorgeous. Large, right? Big, giant mountain. Whoever thinks of that crumbling? When would that happen? You know, God wants us to put our trust in Him. That's what life is for a Christian. Learning every day how to trust God more and give Him control of our lives, more and more each and every day. No matter what's going on, no matter what news you might receive, you can trust God. And in fact, this is what God wants us as a church to focus on this entire year. Don't let the news persuade you. Just trust God. And here's the scripture that he gave us to meditate on the whole year. Psalm 112, 7 says, They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. Christians have no reason to fear anything in in this world or in the world to come. We can confidently, I love that word in that scripture, confidently trust in God to take care of us in any and every situation. As long as you are living the way that God has told you to live, you you have nothing to fear ever, no matter how bad it might look. So we have been studying Psalm 46 this year. So that we're not just placing our trust in someone we don't know. We're learning who God is and why we can trust Him. As I have told you from this pulpit many, many times, don't just trust me because I say something. Go check it out for yourself. So we are looking at Scripture because we know the truth is there. We've already covered Psalm 46.1 and most of 46.2, but today I want to continue in Psalm 46.2. It says, no fear, no pacing, no biting fingernails. When the earth spins out of control, we are sure and fearless when mountains crumble. Last week we talked about the importance of wearing those spiritual shoes that God comes with God's armor. That's for what, uh, what to do when the earth gives way. And we talked about that. Today I want to delve into what we should do when mountains crumble. And when you think of mountains, what kind of pictures pop into your mind? Is it like we have here in this background, is it like the one you have on your handout or in the app on your phone? Big, giant, mountains are giant, strong, solid structures. Most of them are too big to even take in in one look unless you're far enough back, right? We think of mountains as immovable, indestructible, eternal monuments to nature. I mean, mountains have been there for thousands of years. And they'll continue long after we're gone. We don't often think of mountains crumbling. I mean, even with avalanches or mudslides, even through earthquakes... We don't expect mountains to completely crumble or disintegrate the way that Psalm 46, 2 seems to describe. 
We expect mountains to be the same throughout our lives, to never change. You go on a vacation, and you go to the mountains, and you, are, you have this maybe one that you love more than all the others. You just love to sit and look at it or go climb it, whatever it is you're into. You expect every time you go, that mountain is going to be there. It's going to be the same. For mountain climbers, they invite friends. Hey, come and try this place that I found on the mountain that is just wonderful to climb. And they expect when they go back, it'll still be there. Because mountains don't crumble. The same can often be said about the people we look up to. Our heroes. You know, for some people, it might be their parents or grandparents. Maybe it's a historical figure. Movie stars. Some musical icon. Even church leaders. We expect these people to stay the same giant, dependable mountains we've always known. Or there are things that we admire, our institutions. Some people admire our government, or maybe a political party that you put yourself behind. Maybe for some people it's a school. I know a lot of people are very proud of their alma maters. Maybe it's a business or a church. We often feel like These things are mountains that will always remain strong. They'll always be true to us. They'll always stand above their rivals. There's a reason that we think they're the best. But they don't always, do they? Sometimes they crumble. Our institutions might actually become the opposite of what we wanted, of what we thought they were. Our heroes can reveal their sinful nature and fall from the pedestal that we place them on. And we feel devastated when that happens. So what should we do? When our mountains crumble. You know what many people do is they become angry and resentful. After all, how could they let us down? We respected them. We venerated them. We esteemed them. They were our heroes. When our mountains crumble, some people withdraw. And they become distrusting of everything and everyone. They don't want to be hurt again. So they pull away. They hide. But is that the right response? Is that what is best for you? Today, I want to talk about the Bible's answer. What the Bible says we should do when our mountains crumble. So I want you to be thinking about that. Now, I want to talk again about what to do when our mountains crumble. If you want to follow along, you can fill in blanks on the handout that came in your bulletin, or if you have our church app on your phone, you can follow along and fill in the blanks there. But the first thing I want to tell you is when, our, when mountains crumble, we need to re-examine. We need to re-examine. You know, I've talked to people who have quit church, even stopped being a Christian because Someone they looked up to faltered in some way. 
And, and sometimes it's something really bad. Uh, pastor had an affair or a crime was committed. We see these things happen from time to time. Uh, uh, maybe, you know, just a church leader who's selfishly causing harm to people. Sometimes it's something not quite so bad, but bad enough that people say, I'm done. Maybe a harsh statement. Hurt feelings. Because somebody in a church did something, said something, caused anger, resentment. Some people have been hurt by uh, church policies, things they didn't like. I've had that happen to me here. People that said, I don't agree with that rule that you have in the church or something similar, and that's it, they're gone. Or, or Christian businesses. Businesses that say, you know, have the fish on their window or say, you know, we stand for Christ and then they do things that people don't agree Christians should do or, or other religious institutions. Even government agencies or political parties hurt people. And some people will shelter themselves away from everybody to, just to try to keep from getting hurt again. And I'm here to tell you today, don't do that. If you have been hurt by anybody, don't shelter yourself away. Don't go hide. The truth is, you're placing your trust in the wrong place. Here, this might explain a little. Take a look. It can be difficult sometimes for us to hand over control of our life to our loving Creator. But as Christians, we know that we must trust in God, as long as things are going well. If things start to get bad, we should obviously stop trusting Him, because we gave Him control of our life so that He would only have good things happen to us. So if bad things happen in our life, God has clearly violated our trust and needs to earn it back. When we are having trouble in our life, we need to trust in our own ability to fix the situation. But when things calm down and there's nothing to worry about, feel free to trust in God again. Because trusting in God some of the time is better than not trusting Him at all. These have been Deep Thoughts from a Shallow Christian. <laughs> yes, shallow. Very shallow. I know that's funny, but I, I know a lot of people that live like that. Something bad happens. Well, obviously... God doesn't love me. God's not taking care of me. That's it. I don't trust. Jeremiah 17.5 tells us, this is what the Lord says. Bad things will happen to those who put their trust in people. And I'm going to interject here for a second. It doesn't matter who the person is. Doesn't matter if you think they are beyond reproach. Bad things will happen when you trust in a person. Let's continue on with what Jeremiah wrote. Bad things will happen to those who depend on human strength. You can't even trust yourself. That is because they have stopped trusting the Lord. And that's the truth. Listen, if you have mountains in your life that you depend on for always being there, always being strong, unchanging, immovable, you need to re-examine where you are putting your trust. People will let you down. Leaders will hurt you. No one meets the standard of perfection. A few years ago, I had a man who came to visit one Sunday, came to church, and after church, he 
pulled me aside. He said, Pastor, I, I am uh, looking for a church to be mine, to call my home church. But, he said, I have been hurt before. And I want to make Abundant Life my home church. But I want to warn you. If you ever offend me, I'm gone. This is a true story. I said, you know, I'm sorry you've been hurt. But if that is your standard, you might as well leave now. That's what I told him. I said, because at some point, I can promise you, I will say or do something you're not going to like. But before you go, I'd like to recommend you change your policy. Because there is no pastor, no church, in fact, there's no person who can live up to that standard. Eventually, everyone lets you down. Psalm 146.3 says, Don't look to men for help. Their greatest leaders fail. One of my favorite pastors of all time in history, Charles Spurgeon, lived a century ago. He wrote this. He said, Men are always far too apt to depend upon the great ones of earth and forget the great one above. And this habit is the fruitful source of disappointment. Though you should select one son of man out of the many and should imagine that he differs from the rest and may be safely depended on, you will be mistaken. There is none to be trusted. No, not one. Adam fell, therefore lean not on his sons. Man is a helpless creature without God. Therefore, look not for help in that direction. All men are more in appearance than in reality, more in promising than in performing, more apt to help themselves than to help others. How many have turned away heartsick from men on whom they once relied? Never was this the case with a believer in the Lord. He is a very present help in time of trouble. Listen, if you have walked away from church, from God, or just from things that you know you should be doing as a Christian, like being faithful and active in a church ministry, because you've been hurt by someone or by a church, it's time to re-examine where you've been placing your trust. The same is true if you're putting anyone on a pedestal. Expecting and relying on them to never fall off. To always be that mountain in your life. Listen, my friend. Mountains do crumble. Put your trust in God instead. You'll never be let down. In fact, I would like you to make this a matter of a focus of your prayer this week. Monday and Tuesday, when you are in your private time with God, that you have set aside to spend with God every day. You should have done that. I hope you have. If you haven't, you need to. Monday and Tuesday this week, re-examine where you are placing your trust. Will you do that? What, ha what do we do when mountains crumble? We already said we need to re-examine our lives and our priorities. What's next? Number two, we need to reprioritize. 
Reprioritize. You know, once you have re-examined your mountains and you have found that your trust was in the wrong place, it's time to reprioritize your life. Now, i got to tell you something. This is one of the hardest things for Christians to do. It's hard for anybody. But Christians seem to really like and be comfortable with status quo. I once had a pastor that, when I was trying to make some changes in the church, told me, Michael, status quo is okay. We don't need to change things. Well, I disagree. Change is hard. I read an article in uh, Psychology Today this week that said this, change can be frightening, and often we will resist it. Our instinct to continue on the same path is strong even when it's making us unhappy or unhealthy. For example, Psychology Today writes, you stay in a bad relationship or you continue in a career you hate long after the first red flag screaming at you to get out first appear. We're afraid of change because we don't know what the future in which we accept change looks like. But we think we know what the future will look like if we reject change. The problem is that it just isn't true. You can't predict the future in either direction. I think psychology today has got it on this one. Change, though, is necessary for Christians. As much as we want things to stay the same, continuing to do things the same way can lead us to becoming stagnant. That is not what God wants. I remember my first year here. We were having a, uh, I think we called it Heritage Sunday. And it was... People that had come to this church there at some point in their lives coming to help us celebrate the heritage of our church, which is not a bad thing. But I read from a, a sermon, Pastor Timothy Peck of Life Bible Fellowship Church in Upland, California, a message that he had, uh, he had written and preached called Building on a Religious Heritage. I want to read you a portion of that here today. He said, some people treat their religious heritage like a museum. The goal in a museum is to keep everything frozen in time so people can see artifacts from days gone by. Museums are dead places, places that venerate the past rather than look to the future. Instead of treating our heritage as a museum, to preserve. God wants us to build on the foundation laid by those who've gone before us. We don't get rid of the foundation, but we build something new, something fresh, something that will one day become another generation's heritage for them to build on. You see, God's goal for each of us is a life of faith God's not interested in museums. He's interested in people on an adventure of following Jesus, of serving Jesus Christ in their generation. And then he wrote, the church historian Yaroslav Pelikan puts it this way, tradition is the living faith of those now dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of those still living. Good traditions, he writes, invite us to embrace this life of faith for ourselves. But mere traditionalism is content to celebrate the past without walking into the future. 
You see, a heritage is a foundation to build on, not a museum to preserve. I agree. Things need to change for Christians. We need to be constantly changing. Like Max Lucado wrote in his book, Just Like Jesus, God loves you just the way you are, but He refuses to leave you that way. Listen, God is all about changing us into something better. Let me show you some scriptures. Look at first what Jesus said, Matthew 18. Jesus said, what I'm about to tell you is true. You need to change and become like little children. If you don't, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Or how about where Paul wrote in Romans 2.4, God has been kind to you. He has been very patient waiting for you to change. But you think nothing of His kindness. Maybe you don't understand that God is kind to you so that you will decide to change your lives. Or how about this one? For 2 Corinthians 3.18, and our faces are not covered. We all show the Lord's glory. And we are being changed to be like Him. This change in us brings more and more glory. Or as some Bibles put it, from glory to glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Change. God doesn't want us to keep living life like we were living it before we met Him. Or even to keep living the way we were living after we met Him. As we discussed last week, God wants us to follow Him, to become like Him. We should be constantly examining our lives to make sure our priorities are His priorities. That requires us to change. In fact... I'm going to be bold enough to say this. You can quote me on this. This is the most important thing for Christians. Once you have accepted God's free gift of eternal life, your focus should be on changing your life. And it wasn't me that said this, actually. It was Jesus. Look at this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus said, But first and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after His kingdom and His righteousness, His way of doing and being right, the attitude and character of God, and all these things, that is everything else you need in life, will be given to you also. Most importantly, change yourself to be like God. Seek after the attitude and the character of God. Alexander McLaren, McLaurin, excuse me, McLaren, Bible commentator from about a century ago, wrote a book called, uh, or a series called McLaren's Expositions. And in it, he wrote this Such transformation, it must be remembered, comes gradually. The language of this, the text regards it as a lifelong process. We are changed. That is a continuous operation. From glory to glory, that is a course which has well-marked transitions and degrees. Be not impatient if it be slow. It will take a lifetime. Do not fancy that it is finished with you. Life is not long enough for it. Do not be complacent over the partial transformation which you have felt. 
There is but a fragment of the great image yet reproduced in your soul, a faint outline dimly traced with many a feature wrongly drawn, with many a line still needed before it can be called even approximately complete. See to it that you neither turn away your gaze nor relax your efforts till all that you have beheld in Him is repeated in you. Check your priorities. Are they the same as God's? They should be. Are you putting God's kingdom and righteousness above everything else in your life? You should be. It's time to reprioritize. We need to pray like David did in Psalm 119.37 when he wrote, Turn my eyes away from vanity, all those worldly, meaningless things that distract let your priorities be mine and restore me with renewed energy in your ways. If you want to be the person God wants you to be, reprioritize your life. Let's make that a focus of prayer this week as well. Wednesday and Thursday. Ask God to help you reprioritize. Last point for today. We've already talked about when mountains crumble, what we need to do. First of all, we need to re-examine our lives. Second of all, we need to reprioritize. Last point is Rededicate. After we have re-examined and we have reprioritized, you know, when we first accept God's free gift of eternal life, things seem so clear, don't they? I mean, we we seem to swim in God's presence, surrounded by His Holy Spirit, and we want to do everything we can to please God. But you know, after a little while, it seems like this wears off a little. We don't feel the presence of the Holy Spirit like we did at first. We aren't moved to live just for God anymore. But instead, we begin to go back to a few of our old habits, our old selfish ways. It's human nature. Even while remaining faithful to our Christian routine, it's easy to lose our first love. Jesus talked about this in Revelation chapter 2. Verses 3 and 4, he said to the church at Ephesus, I know that you who believe are enduring patiently and are bearing up for my name's sake, that you have not grown weary of being faithful to the truth. But I have this charge against you, that you have left your first love. You have lost the depth of love that you first had for me. The church in Ephesus was doing all of the right things. They were doing the work of ministry that was expected of them. Jesus commended them for their faithfulness and their hard work. From the outside, as far as anybody could tell, they were the perfect church but to God. They were pulling away from the relationship that He once had with them. 
It's so easy to get into a routine as a Christian and think you're being a good Christian. You go to church every Sunday, you pray and read your Bible every day. You even talk to your friends about Jesus. And from the outside, it looks like you're right where you need to be. But no one else can see how your relationship with God is doing. Only you and God know that. We talk a lot in our church about how God wants us to be obedient. Wants us to obey Him. And that is true. But I'm here to tell you that God isn't interested in how well we follow a list of rules. That's not the point of Christianity. We don't earn brownie points by following a list of rules. God wants us to obey, absolutely. But He wants us to obey Him because we love Him. Let me give you an example. We had Valentine's Day this week. I had a question for you. Would you rather someone gave you a gift on Valentine's Day because they were trying to earn your favor, get something out of you, or because they were merely showing their love for you. I mean, either way, you get a gift. But which way means more to you? See, this is the difference in how God feels in our reasons for obedience. If we obey because we know that's what Christians do, we know that's what we're supposed to do. And we want to make it into heaven. Well, there's no love there. In fact, honestly, if that is the reason you obey, it, it really just means you're selfish. You're only concerned about getting to heaven. You're not really concerned about God. You're concerned about you. That's not what God wants. What God wants is a relationship with us that is founded in mutual love. And Jesus gave us a great example of this when He was here on earth. Look at this with me in Luke chapter 10. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord... Doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. What God desires is your love. It's through love that we show our devotion, our obedience, our faithfulness. It's through love. We show how 
the reason that we give to the church or do work at the church. If that is just to try to earn God's favor, that's not the way it works. It's through love that we do these things. All the things that you think of when you think of what it means to be a good Christian. It means so much more when we do these things as a way to show God our love. I happened to notice when Brandon was up here giving announcements how he slipped an announcement in there that wasn't in the bulletin. He talked about Tuesday night we have prayer. Wednesday night we have Bible study. Oh, and Thursday night we clean the church. He just happens to be in charge of the janitorial. I like how you slipped that in there. That was good. And we do need people to help take care of our church and God's house. But if you do that because you're trying to earn brownie points somewhere... You're not doing it right. We need to do everything we do. From the time we wake up in the morning, every prayer we pray, every word we read in the Bible, every word spoken to anyone about God, Jesus, God's kingdom, the gospel, needs to be done in love. Because of love that we have for God. So my question to you as we finish this message for today is do you have this kind of love for God? The sons of Korah wrote the psalm that we sang a little bit earlier, Psalm 42.1. Just like a deer that craves streams of water, my whole being craves you, God. Can you say that? Is that the kind of relationship you have with God where you crave His presence? You can't wait until you sit down and meet with Him in a private time. Or how about Asaph who wrote this, Psalm 73, 25, As long as I have you, God, I don't need anyone else in heaven or on earth. You don't need a spouse. You don't need a boyfriend or girlfriend. You need God. Is that the way you feel? Is that the kind of love you feel for God? As long as I got you, I don't need anybody else. Because that's the kind of love God feels for you. Have you lost the depth of the love that you used to have for God? Do you feel like You've yet to reach the fullness of your heart's ability to love God. That you know you've got more to go. Well, now that you have re-examined and reprioritized yourself, it's time to rededicate your life to God. To dedicate to Him all of your love. When we talk about, as we do every Sunday morning, giving your life to God, giving Him control, this is what we're talking about. Dedicating all the love you have to Him. Not reserving an ounce of it for yourself. So that even if it means you have to suffer to give God the love He deserves, you're willing to do it. Even if it means you have to go without 
in order to show God love. Because you have dedicated every ounce of love you have to Him. It's worth it. And you do it. This Friday and Saturday, dedicate yourself fully to God and His kingdom. All the love you have. The obedience, yes. The faithfulness, yes. The work, yes. But all out of love. As the worship team comes and we end this service for today, let's have everybody stand. You know, let's, let's not wait until Friday to rededicate our lives. We have a great opportunity right now to give God everything in love, to dedicate our lives to Him, to love Him deeper than ever before. If you're ready to dedicate once again, rededicate all of your love, all of your life, all of your obedience to God, I invite you to come down here to the front and just lay your life out on the altar here, metaphorically speaking. Give God everything you have. Just come on down. This is a great time for you to say, God, once again, I want to give you everything. I don't want to hold anything back. I rededicate my life to you. This is something we should be doing every day. But here's a great opportunity for you to do it. Right here in church, right in front of everyone, to show people you're not embarrassed. You belong completely to Him. See, this is what we need to do when our mountains crumble. Realize that we shouldn't have been relying on those mountains in the first place. 